Great, so thank you very much, Elizabeth, for the invitation, for the other organizers as well. Very happy to speak in this uh, workshop. Um, so, so my topic is uh, something I did uh, well, over a year ago already. Um, so uh, I, I've had the chance to speak in some other venues, but not in front of, uh, of our community here. So I thought this would be a good chance to, uh, to, to present it here. And, and this work is about functional inequalities. Okay, so uh, let me maybe start by uh, explaining what I mean uh, by those, and I might as well define them on a general metric measure space. So we have a metric space XD, which we assume is complete and separable, let's say, uh, and M is a locally finite Borel measure on this metric space. Uh, so given a locally Lipschitz test function F, uh, we use this notation to define the local Lipschitz constant of F, uh, defined as the limb soup when Y goes to X of the usual uh, quotient of differences. Uh, so uh, I'm using this uh, very suggestive notation, the, the length of the gradient, but remember there's no, there's no differentiable structure here. Uh, this is just convenient notation, but of course, uh, if we're in the smooth setting, if you're in a Riemannian manifold, then this would exactly correspond to the Riemannian length of your, of your gradient. Uh, so now given a subset omega of our space X, let me denote by lambda star of omega, uh, where star will correspond to the particular functional inequality we're interested in. So lambda star of omega will denote the best constant so that the following should hold for any locally Lipschitz test function f and omega. Uh, so the first example is the most classical example probably is that of the Poincaré inequality. So this is the requirement that for uh, any uh, function which integrates to zero in omega, we have this relation between the uh, L2 norm of the function and the L2 norm of the gradient of the function, the, the energy. Uh, and the best constant here would denote by lambda two of omega. Uh, so if you're in the smooth setting and you, you're able to integrate this expression by parts, it's very well known and classical and easy to see that this corresponds to the first uh, non-zero eigenvalue of the Neumann Laplacian on omega. Okay, so that's lambda two. Of course, you can generalize this uh, definition to study LP Poincaré inequalities for P in this range, let's say. And then this is the requirement that for any test function F, which satisfies this now natural balancing condition, we have this relation between the LP norm of F and the LP norm of the gradient of F. And the best constant is denoted by lambda sub P of omega. And finally, the third kind of inequality we'll be interested in is the log Sobolev inequality, which is the requirement that under this now ba uh, natural balancing condition on F, we have this relation between the L2 norm of the gradient on the right-hand side, but here we use kind of an L2 log L type norm, some, somehow a, a small strengthening of, of the L2 norm here. Uh, and the best constant uh, here up to this traditional factor of two is denoted by lambda LS for, for log Sobolev, okay? Any question? Are you with me? Give me some sign of life, because who knows? Yes. Yes, great. Thank you. So uh, what is our goal? Uh, so we would like to get some non-trivial uh, bound on our constants lambda star, uh, depending, of course, on our metric measure space, and let's say on an upper bound on the diameter of our set omega. Uh, and by non-trivial, I mean, uh, you know, anything strictly positive is already interesting. Uh, the problem with the way I've set things up so far is that you can never get something non-trivial. The, the best function you can write here is zero. And the reason is very simple, because for instance, if you choose omega to be a disconnected set, then uh, of course you can choose a test function, which is piecewise constant, right? And by playing with the values of the constants, you can always enforce uh, this balancing condition. But since the function is piecewise constant, the length of the grain is just zero. So the right-hand side is zero, the left-hand side is not zero. So the optimal constants here are just zero. So therefore, if OM is disconnected, you cannot say anything. So you may say, okay, maybe this is a topological problem. Maybe I should have uh, demanded that omega be connected, but the same problem will occur if omega is connected, but has an arbitrarily kind of small next. Okay, so this is not topological. Wait, 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 can I ask, uh, but this is, is this the case in the, the Euclidean setting as well? Yes. Isn't it true that the you, lambda two you can bound? No, if it's disconnected, it's zero. And because if it's connected? The explanation I just gave, just piecewise constant function, okay? 
So the typical assumption uh, in the literature is indeed to assume that omega is in some sense convex because morally speaking, convexity is exactly the property which uh, prohibits the existence of small necks in your domain. Uh, and in the metric space setting, the natural assumption is to assume that omega is geodesically convex, meaning that between any two points, x and y and omega, there exists a distance minimizing geodesic connecting the two points, which lies entirely inside omega. And in this talk, all geodesics are always distance minimizing geodesics. So indeed, uh, under this uh, additional assumption of convexity, uh, there are well-known examples in the Riemannian setting. So for instance, if you have a convex domain omega and a Riemannian manifold with a canonical Riemannian volume measure, then for instance, if Ricci curvature is non-negative and the diameter of your convex set is at most D, then the classical Li Yao Zhong Yang estimate tells us that uh, the Poincare constant uh, is at least pi squared over D squared, and this is best possible, cannot be improved. Uh, similarly, uh, it's well known to experts, but uh, I, don't, I don't know who to attribute this to. It's, it's folklore. It's known that the log Sobolev constant under these assumptions share exactly the same bound uh, up to a constant. Uh, it's of the order of uh, one over D squared. Uh, I should mention for those of you looking for interesting problems, the, I believe that the optimal value of this constant is actually an open problem. It's a one dimensional problem. It's one dimensional nonlinear optimization problem. The natural conjecture is that it should be pi squared like here, but I believe this is open. Okay. Uh, of course, if Ricci is not just non-negative, if it's strictly positive, if it's strictly positive, banished from below by a strictly positive k, then uh, we also have the classical Lishnirovich estimate stating that lambda two is at least the curvature lower bound k times n over n minus one. So now you see the dimension of the manifold uh, come, come into play. Uh, and the by now classical Bakriam re estimate states that the log Sobolev constant enjoys exactly the same bound. Okay. And there are some, and these are all best possible. Okay. Uh, I'm sorry, can I ask um, what's the difference with Faber Kron and Li, the, the, what you stated as Li Yao? Isn't that Faber, Faber Kron is for the Dirichlet, first eigenvalue, you get a lower bound. Right. You, you, get, a, you get a, not a lower, you get an upper. Okay. Bound. Okay. 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 I mean, got it. Yeah. Okay. So, um, the and, and there's some similar sharp results for the LP point correct constant. Okay. Uh, which I just don't mention. Okay. Uh, what is the problem already with this approach? The problem with assuming convexity in the sub Riemannian setting, which I'll get to in a second. Don't worry. I'll, I'll explain what I mean. The problem is that geodesically convex domains are scarce. They almost do not exist. Uh, and my favorite example in this, uh, about this is due to Monty and Rickley, who showed that on the simplest example of a sub-Riemannian manifold, uh, the first Heisenberg group, H1. So again, I'll get to the definition in a second. Uh, the only thing you need to know for now is that this is a three-dimensional differentiable manifold with, with a certain uh, metric structure. Okay, but the point is that on H1, no, there are no geodesically convex geodesic balls. And this is very uh, in, in stark contrast to the Riemannian setting, where we know that if you pick a, a ball which is small enough, uh, small enough radius, it's always going to be geodesically convex. Uh, and in fact, Monty and Rickley showed that the smallest geodesically convex set, which contains three distinct points not lying on a common geodesic, is already the whole space itself, H1. Okay, so of course there are geodesically convex sets, subsets of geodesics, but if you go beyond that, you already get the full space. So in this very strong sense, there are just no non-trivial geodesically convex sets on H1. Okay, so it just will not help us if we prove something on a geodesically convex subset of a sub manifold. So we need some other solution. And our solution is going to be to replace our set omega on the right-hand side, on the energy side of our inequalities with a slightly larger set, which we call, uh, which we denote by geo of omega. What is geo of omega? This is the two-point geodesic hull of omega. This is just the union over all geodesics emanating and terminating in omega, okay? So let's see an example, uh, which already tells us that the two-point geodesic hull need not be geodesically convex itself, which is good news. Otherwise we would get an H1, we would get the whole space as soon as we take the, 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 the geodesic hull. 
For instance, uh, just think of Carl Theodore's theorem. We know that in order to get the convex hull in Rn, we need to use n plus one points. So if we're on the plane and we take these three points, the vertices of this triangle, the two-point geodesic hull is just the boundary of this triangle, whereas the convex hull, of course, is the full solid triangle. So the two-point geodesic hull need not be geodesically convex, which is good news. Another very simple observation is that if omega is already strongly geodesically convex to begin with, then this operation doesn't do anything. So in this sense, we're only generalizing the previous approach, uh, for instance, uh, in the Riemannian setting where people were only looking at convex sets. So, you know, if, if you just, if omega is already convex, then uh, what our, our kind of modification doesn't do anything. So we're only studying something more general. And the final piece of good news is just by using the triangle inequality, it's, it's immediate to check that if you take the two point geodesic hull of a geodesic ball of radius R and any metric space, this is all, always a subset of the geodesic ball of radius 2R. So this means that this operation doesn't increase our sets by too much. Okay. So indeed, let's go back to our definition of our uh, functional inequalities and let's take, let's modify the, the right-hand side to use the two-point geodesic hull. And now our, our question makes perfect sense. Now you can use your favorite omega, could be disconnected, whatever you want. Now there is a chance to get some non-trivial result. Okay? Emmanuel? Yes? Uh, if I want to normalize the, both the left-hand side and the right-hand side by the volume of the set, I want to, you know, take an average okay. instead. Of, would this make sense, or is it clear? It would make sense, but it would, uh, you know, make is the it clearly impossible. Or? or everything? No, it's everything is possible. It's just that uh, okay. Our, our results, which I will show you, um, they have a nice feature that they're going to be dimension independent. If you do what you suggest, that might ruin it. Okay, <laughs> but certainly you can do that. But but of course it will affect uh, the result. Yeah, I meant, could you get a dimension-free, you know, thing like? I don't. So you know that you cannot, or you just don't know I, that you I, can? I don't know, and I'm doubtful. But, okay. but that's already, uh, yeah, maybe at the end. If, if you want to ask me again at the end, I have something to say. Okay. In, cool. Emmanuel? Thanks. Yes? Yeah, is there a degree of freedom here in how you kind of, like, extend F beyond omega? Like, because... You know, F is uh, yeah okay. So F is just the locally Lipschitz function defined on the whole space, or or just on the on the geodesic hull. Okay, so you you start with a function which is defined, and then this result holds for any such function. Okay. Okay. There's no like you know Whitney extension domain and so on. Okay. So this is about functional inequalities. Now, what do I mean by subriemannian manifolds? Okay, so uh, here's my one slide crash course in subriemannian manifolds. So we start with a smooth, connected, differentiable, n-dimensional manifold, okay? And the idea is basically that, you know, there are certain directions in which you're prohib you're, you're not allowed to move in. So the legal directions in which you're allowed to move are called the distribution. So formally speaking, the distribution is a sub-bundle of the tangent bundle. And the rank of the distribution, this is just the dimension of this distinguished subspace of legal directions. The interesting situation is when the rank is strictly smaller than the topological dimension n. So this means that you have really directions in which you're not allowed to move. So what you do is you define an inner product just on the distribution, on the legal directions, and you proceed as you do in the Riemannian set. Now, uh, without loss of generality, one can always uh, uh, assume that this distribution is spanned by even globally defined vector fields, not necessarily linearly independent, but globally defined vector fields. And an important condition for us is going to be so-called Hermander's bracket generating condition. This is the condition that the, these vector fields together with their iterated Lie brackets, if you take all the Lie brackets, then you're already going to span the entire tangent space. Okay, that's a very important condition because this assures that the distribution that one gets is uh, what is called completely non-integrable. This means that there are no integrable submanifolds in your space. This means that between any two points, X and Y, you can always find a path just going in the legal direction, which connects X and Y in a finite amount of time. Okay, this is the chow Rashevsky theorem. So this condition will always be enforced for us. Okay, so 
now that you have, uh, you know, we've specified our legal directions, uh, we can talk about legal curves or horizontal curves. What are those? So this is an absolutely continuous map from the interval zero one to our space. And in fact, all of our curves, all of our geodesics will always be parameterized on the interval zero one. Uh, and as we said, they're only, we're only allowed to move in the, in the legal direction. So the derivative is always a subset of the distribution. And now that we have a notion of a horizontal curve, well, we can just define its length in the usual way we do in the Riemannian setting, you know, this way. And this is clearly uh, invariant under reparameterization. Um, and now that we have a notion of length of legal curves, we can talk about the so-called Carnot Carthéodori sub Riemannian metric, uh, in which the distance between two points x and y is defined as the infimum over all lengths of curves which are legal, which are horizontal, connecting x and y. Okay, you take the, you know, the most efficient uh, path. Uh, and uh, as we said, thanks to Hermann's condition, this is always going to be finite. Now, in addition, if as a metric space, so this gives, it's easy to, to see that this is a, gives us a metric. If as a metric space, this space is complete, then this infimum is always going to be attained. And any horizontal curve, on which this minimum is attained is called a distance minimizing geodesic. I'll just say geodesic. Okay, so this is a geodesic for our sub Riemannian metric structure. Okay, one last thing I'm going to need, but I'm not going to define it. This is very technical and for experts, uh, this is uh, the notion of being ideal. So a uh, sub Riemannian manifold is called ideal if it is both complete as a metric space, we, we know what that means. And there's, there's something which is called there are no abnormal non trivial geodesics. So let me not define what this is. Uh, let me just tell you that almost all of our examples will always be ideal. And furthermore, being ideal is a generic property of a sub Riemannian manifold for a generic choice of distribution. So, so let's not get, go into this, okay? Now, of course, I need to give you one concrete example of a sub Riemannian manifold. And of course, the one I, uh, I'm going to use is the Heisenberg group. So what is this? So the Dieth Heisenberg group, HV, so first of all, it's ideal. So let's get this out of the way, it's ideal. It's a Carnot group. What is a Carnot group? This is um, a connected, simply connected, nilpotent Lie group with a certain stratification of its Lie algebra. Okay, forget about these fancy words, what does it mean? So for, for this example, what are the elements? We have a D-dimensional vector of complex numbers, Z1 through ZD, and an additional real value coordinate. This coordinate will be called the vertical direction. These are called the horizontal directions. Okay, so as a, as a, uh, as a manifold, this has real dimension 2D plus one, okay? What is the group action? Well, on the first D complex numbers, you just use the usual additive group structure, Not, nothing fancy going on, just, just addition. The whole action happens on the last coordinate. What you do is you, in addition to adding them, you also have this kind of twisting condition. Okay, so this makes the group interesting. It's very easy to check that the, this is a Lie group, so it has a Haar measure. Turns out that this, the bi-invariant Haar measure for the uh, Heisenberg group is just the usual Lebesgue measure on 2D plus one dimensional space. Okay, now I didn't tell you what is the distribution. What is the distribution? Uh, well, first of all, of course, we would like the distribution to be compatible with the group structure. So we would like to choose an invariant set of generators for our distribution. So what we do is as follows. So I just have to pick them at the origin and then move them along the group action. And at the origin, I'm going to pick 2D linearly independent vector fields, vectors. Uh, so this means that the rank of our distribution is going to be 2D. So this means that the core rank is one because the dimension is 2D plus one. So what we do is we just, use, we just declare at the origin that the movement in the horizontal direction is legal. These are 2D real directions, right? And then we just, uh, we just move them via the group structure. And if you make the computation, you get this formula for the vector fields generating our distribution. Okay. Um, let's check that Hermander's condition is satisfied. So it's immediate to compute that if you take the Lie bracket of X and Y, you're going to get Z, the vertical direction. And after that, you already spent everything, right? We just had to complete, we just had to find one additional uh, direction to span the entire tangent space. Okay, so this is what it's called a step two Carnot group because you just needed to do two steps in order to span everything. Sometimes you need to do more steps. 
So the best thing about this slide that I have is, of course, not mine. This is due to uh, Nate Eldridge. And this is this beautiful graphic. What we see here is the unit geodesic ball in H1. Remember that H1 is a three-dimensional manifold, which we can canonically identify with R3. There are some canonical coordinates, exponential coordinates. OK, and if you plot it out, it looks like this. You've never seen such a geodesic ball. It looks like an apple shape. And if you know a bit more, this really confirms the Monty Rickley uh, result about this geodesic ball not being geodesically convex. OK, the, these horizontal lines show you that it's not geodesically convex. Uh, another nice thing about this graphic is this blue curve. What is this? This is the distance minimizing geodesic connecting the origin with the North Pole. OK, so as we said, all points are connected. And this turns out to be a geodesic. Why? Well, it's impossible to move in. The, it's, we're not allowed to move in the vertical direction, right? That's illegal. However, we can still get a vertical movement because remember the Lie bracket of X and Y, which basically means what happens if you rotate X in the direction of Y and vice versa. Uh, this creates a vertical movement. So in order to go in the illegal vertical direction, we can achieve this via rotation. Okay, so this is how a geodesic looks like. But basically, the gist of it is that the Hausdorff, uh, sorry, the Hazemer group is basically the sub Riemannian analog of flat Euclidean space, but of course, it's very different. So, for instance, uh, its topological dimension is 2D plus 1, but its Hausdorff dimension is 2D plus 2, because the Hausdorff dimension of the vertical axis is 2 and not 1, because you have to work twice as hard in order to move in the vertical direction. You have to move in the X and Ys together. Okay? So that's my kind of crash uh, course on, on um, Heisenberg group. And now I can finally formulate our main result, which states as follows. So if we have a subset omega of the D Heisenberg group, whose diameter is at most D, then the following uh, functional inequalities hold. Poincaré inequality, LP Poincaré, and log Sobolov inequality. And we see that the constants that we get here are explicit and moreover, up to this factor of one quarter, which is marked in blue, we get exactly the same expressions as we do in Euclidean space Rn, or more generally for Riemannian manifolds with non-negative Ricci curvature. This is this pi squared over d squared is the Liao uh, Zhang Yang constant. This is this folklore constant over d squared log Sobolev constant. And I, I didn't mention this before. This is the expression, uh, the sharp expression for the LP Poincaré constant. Uh, on such manifolds, okay? But up to a factor one quarter, we get exactly the same thing. Now, of course, such type of results were known in the literature. Typically, one studies a geodesic ball here, and on the right-hand side, one gets uh, maybe a larger geodesic ball. Uh, but if you look at the constants here that in, in, in the literature, they're somehow always, almost essentially all, uh, always uh, non-explicit. They depend implicitly on the various parameters. And in particular, they always depend on the dimension. Sometimes this is not exactly explicit. Sometimes this is via the doubling constant of the space, but it, they always depend on the dimension. So to the best of my knowledge, this is the first uh, dimension independent estimates on the Heisenberg group. You see, it does not depend on the dimension. It does not depend on D. Okay. Um, well, but did you say the, in mm -hmm. the other results, do they also consider geodesic uh, convex holes? No, that, no, that's in a kind of a new uh, thing uh, that, that we came up with because of the method of proof. Uh, but uh, they do typically consider a larger set. Okay. However, I should say there is a, a tightening technique. So if you know it, for instance, for a ball and a larger ball, you can always get, there, there, there's a tightening method to get the same result for a ball with the same ball here, but with extreme deterioration of the constant. And, and the dimension is going to come into play then. So it's possible to tighten if you pay a dimension dependent price. Okay. But with our formulation, it turns out to be dimension independent. And, and you know that if you take the geodesic ball on both sides, there is no dimension independent inequality? I, I presume there is no, but I don't know of such a result. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Um, okay. Um, now you, you can ask me, you know, is this particular to the Heisenberg group? And the answer is no. So actually, I don't want to go into it, but it holds for more general situation. You can treat arbitrary Carnot groups of co rank one, exactly the same thing. They don't even have to be ideal. 
or you can study ideal subramanian manifolds and there's a whole list and you know you can look at the paper and there's an even larger list of things but then you might need to replace the one quarter with some other constants okay but I, let, it's already you know something just for the heisenberg group so let's stick to it okay these are our results any questions Okay, I'm running late, I know, but I need to go through this. So anyway, I want to talk about the proof because it's really maybe more interesting even. Uh, so the proof is heavily going to use optimal transform. So uh, again, we're on back to our metric measure space. Uh, we're going to, to define the L2 Wasserstein distance W2 between two probability measures defined on X. This P2 here means that they have uh, finite second moments. How is W2 defined? Well, you, took, you, you take a look at all possible couplings a coupling is a probability measure pi defined on the product space so that its first marginal is mu naught and its second marginal is this target measure mu one. And you try to kind of transport mu naught onto mu one optimally in this L2, in this L2 sense. You're trying to minimize this expression. It's not hard to show that this is a metric and it turns out that W2 weakly metrizes P2X yielding also a complete and separable metric space called the Wasserstein space, W2. A very nice feature of this procedure is that if the original space that you started from is a geodesic space, so if between any two points there exists a distance minimizing geodesic connecting the two points, that this happens if and only if the resulting Wasserstein space is also a geodesic space. Okay, so how, how so that's very nice. How does the geodesic look on this Wasserstein space? A geodesic is basically a family of probability measures, mu t, indexed by the parameter t. The, I can call it the time parameter or an interpolation parameter. So this interpolates, it kind of morphs between the original measure, mu naught, and the target measure, mu one. And as you vary t, you get this morphing. And the actual transport occurs along geodesics gamma on your original space x. Okay, I'm being vague here because I don't have time. Okay, so don't, don't worry about this point. So let's now come to the result which served as kind of a starting point for our work. And in the Riemannian setting, this is completely classical, already a 20 year old result due to Dario Cordero, Roskan, uh, Makan, and Schmuckenschlager. Uh, they showed this for complete Riemannian manifolds. But in the, in the sub Riemannian setting, this is recent. Uh, the, for ideal sub Riemannian manifolds, this is due to Barilari and Rizzi. And for non necessarily ideal co rank one groups, this is due to Balo, Cristalli, and Siebels. Okay, so assume that you have such a sub Riemannian manifold. In fact, for the volume, for the measure, you can take any uh, smooth, strictly positive uh, density. That's not a problem. Um, and they have to be one of these guys, okay? Ideal sub Riemannian or Kernel rank one. Uh, co rank one kernel group. So assume that you have two compactly supported probability measures, mu naught and mu one, which are both absolutely continuous with respect to the ambient measure M. So we can, it's a geodesic space. You can look at the Wasserstein geodesic and it's well known, turns out that this geodesic is actually unique. There's a unique way to connect them. These are old results uh, due to Figali and Leford. And moreover, it's unique and it's going to remain absolutely continuous for all times t. So let's denote the density at time t by rho sub t. Then it turns out that for all times t, you have this type of interpolation inequality for all geodesics gamma, which participate in the transport. So the result is that if you look at the density rho t at time t and you evaluate it at the t midpoint of the geodesic gamma t, and you take this negative one over n, n is the dimension power, then this expression is bounded below by whatever happens at time zero, so some, some combination of whatever happens at time zero and whatever happens at time one. It's an interpolation result. Usually in convexity, we're used to seeing, you know, as, as interpolation coefficients, one minus t here and t, right? But no, in this case, you see some type of other coefficients beta, which are called measure distortion coefficients. I don't have time to explain uh, what these are. You can, you can read if you want, and this is being recorded. But basically, these coefficients, in some sense, capture the effect of curvature on your space, curvature of the space and of the measure. OK, so you see the effect of curvature. Uh, now, of course, if you're on an n-dimensional model Riemannian space, 
So uh, with Ricci curvature equal to K, so in K zero, I mean just flat Euclidean space. When K is positive, I mean the sphere. And when K is negative, I mean hyperbolic space. Then on these model spaces, of course, you can just make the computation. You can compute these beta, uh, beta T explicitly. So in flat Euclidean space, beta will be what you expect, which is just one minus T here and T here. Uh, but on the sphere, it will be some ratio of signs. In hyperbolic space, it will be some ratio of hyperbolic signs. You can write the formula explicitly, but you know there's no need. The only thing is that I want to give this a name. So let's denote the Riemannian model coefficients by tau. Okay, and they depend on K, the model Ricci curvature, on capital N, the model dimension, on T, which is the interpolation parameter. And also when, when K is not equal to zero, so on the sphere, on hyperbolic space, it's also going to depend on theta, which is the distance between the two points. You don't see this in the flat space, but on the sphere and in hyperbolic space, uh, it will depend on the distance between the points. Okay, so let's just give this a name, tau. What's also very easy in classical is by classical uh, Riemannian comparison theorems, whenever you have a general manifold whose dimension is upper bounded by capital N and whose Ricci curvature is lower bounded by capital K, it's easy to show that these distortion coefficients will be lower bounded by the model Riemannian ones. And that's very good because lower bounding is exactly the direction that we want in order to kind of concatenate with this inequality, okay? Uh, and indeed, this observation, I think, served as a great stimulus uh, to the celebrated work by Sturm and Lot Villani some more than 15 years ago. I've I hope that you've all heard about this work. Basically, their idea was that they were trying to find some method to describe what is a generalized Ricci curvature of a space without any differentiable structure. Now, this seem seems at first impossible because when we think about curvature, we think of two derivatives. So how can you talk about uh, two derivatives without a differentiable structure? But they noticed that actually this work of Cordero, Macan, Schmuckenschlager is actually a characterization of having a Ricci curvature lower bound and dimension upper bound. And this is a synthetic way to talk about such things. And you see, there's no differentiable structure here. You just need to talk about Wasserstein space, about probability measures, about densities. There's no derivatives here. So actually they defined what it means to satisfy the curvature dimension CDKM condition on very general metric measure space se uh, setting. And in fact, uh, their theory became very, very successful. And nowadays, more or less any theorem that you can prove in the Riemannian setting, you can also prove for ge very general uh, metric me uh, measure space says satisfying the CDKM condition. Okay, so what is their definition? So. Uh, on general spaces, the definition is more involved, but uh, in, in our setting, well, for what it's called the Munch space, uh, it, it, it's exactly what I told you. It basically says that we just want to have this interpolation inequality with the model Riemannian coefficients, tau Km. Okay, this is the CDKM condition. Another condition which I'm going to need is the slight relaxation of this condition, which was introduced a few years later by Sturm and independently Ota. This is the measure contraction property MCPKN. What is this? It's very simple to explain. You see, in the previous uh, definition, we had two terms on the right side. So what we do is we simply remove the second term. Let's just throw this second term, this guy, throw it away. Okay, throw it away. So this means that, you know, this is just a weaker, weaker uh, uh, requirement. So this is a weaker requirement. Uh, but if we threw this away, well, there's no reason to assume now that the target measure is absolutely continuous because we don't need to talk about its density. So it could be anything, also discrete measure. And if we're treating discrete measures, we might as well, and this turns out to be equivalent, we, just, we can just take a delta measure at a single point. So what this thing is measuring is what happens when you contract mu naught to a single point. This is why it's called measure contraction property. Okay. The only thing we need to know that is that it's weaker than CDK. And now finally, I can tell you why the sub Riemannian setting is more challenging than its Riemannian counterpart. Uh, this goes back to the PhD thesis of Julien, who uh, showed this first for the Heisenberg group, but then extended his result to all strictly sub Riemannian manifolds. And he showed that never, these guys never satisfy any CDKN condition for any value of K, for any value of capital N. So this beautiful lodge to Mulani theory can never be applicable to the sub-Riemannian setting. So we cannot use it. That's the bad news. 
However, the good news is that he showed that the Heisenberg group does satisfy the weaker MCP condition. With which parameters? Well, the curvature parameter is zero. That's not surprising because it's basically the analog of flat space. So the, it, it, of course, has to be flat. But with which dimension? And here's a surprise. Remember, the topological dimension of the Heisenberg group was 2D plus 1. The Hausdorff dimension was 2D plus 2. But the sharp dimension for the MCP condition that he found was 2D plus 3. So twice above the topological dimension. And already note that if you denote this by capital N and the topological dimension by little n, notice that you have this formula, amazing formula, two to the power of capital N little, minus little n is equal to four. And this four exactly explains why we get the one quarter in all of our results. It's exactly from this expression, okay? So of course, uh, the MCP condition turns out to be pretty useful in the Subramanian setting. And indeed, many authors uh, have established the MCP condition on a variety of Subramanian manifolds, such as the ones that I've kind of alluded to in my slides with the results. Okay, uh, so this is well known, and this was the starting point of our work. So let's go back to the barilari rizzi balo cristalli sipos theorem. What can we do? Well, the MC MCP condition is known. For, was known for us. That's a calculation that people have made. And it's a, a few lines computation to show that this implies that these beta coefficients, these measured distortion coefficients, are lower bound because basically these coefficients basically also measure contraction to a point. So these coefficients are lower bounded by the model Riemannian ones coming from the MCP condition. So that's also immediate to show. So that's great because we can just plug this into this interpolation theorem. And we see that we get this interpolation property, which is actually stronger than MCP. So MCP has this, uh, if you know this theorem, it, has, it enjoys a self-improvement, self-strengthening type condition. Uh, MCP would be this inequality without this term. Okay, but we actually have a full interpolation between both times, zero and one. So that's nice. However, the problem is with this exponent. You see, for all strictly subramanian manifolds, this exponent, capital N divided by little n, is always strictly larger than one, okay? So this means that when you go to the endpoints in your interpolation, when you go to t equals one or t equals zero, then this thing, you would like it to decay linearly, like t and one minus t, but it's going to decay much faster, like t squared or t to the power of 1.1. 1, 1 .1. And that's not good. This means you don't have good control at the edges. Okay, that's very bad. And this is why all previous kind of approaches using optimal transport have failed. So what we're going to do is something very simple. Well, I can kind of artificially correct the exponent here, okay, and turn it into one if I just apply Jensen's inequality. And if I do this, you'll see that I get this constant Q. I'll pick up this extra constant, which exactly is of the form two to the power of capital N minus little n. And what I'll get is this interpolation inequality now, uh, where, okay, I managed to make the powers one here, so that's nice, but there's no free lunch. The price I paid is this extra constant. So let's turn this into a definition, and we'll say that this requirement is exactly the QCD condition. Q stands for quasi-convex relaxation of the original CDKN condition. And Q, our new parameter Q, is kind of a slack parameter. So it's always larger than one. And if you set it to be equal to one, so this thing is just one, you get back the original CDKN condition. So it's just a generalization. It's a relaxation of the CDKN condition. Okay. Now, please tell me how much time I have. I know I started a bit late and there were a few questions, but tell me and I will stop when, whenever is needed. Let's make it like uh, time's up, but we started a bit late. So let's make it three more minutes. Okay. Great, great, great. Perfect. Thank you. So um, why do we like the QCD condition? Because of the following one-dimensional, uh, uh, very simple proposition, uh, that if you have a one-dimensional density on the real line, uh, density with respect to the one-dimensional Lebesgue measure, for which this space satisfies our QCD condition with parameter Q, then you can always modify your density H to another density F, so that the resulting space exactly satisfies CDKN. And in your modification, you didn't pay too much of a price. So the new density F 
is sandwiched between H and Q times H. So up to a factor of Q, you changed, but then you get exactly CDKN. The proof is very simple. Basically, you construct F as a CDKN upper envelope of H, okay? Just as you construct, for instance, uh, you know, you can take a, for a general function, you could take its concave upper envelope and get a concave function. And you just have to compute and see that you didn't change your, your original density by too much. So trust me on this. This is very simple. The problem is that this is really a one dimensional property. It doesn't, you, you will not get this property, such a nice price, just Q in, in, in RM. Okay, so really in order to use this property, you need some tool to reduce to dimension one. And here comes basically my last slide, I guess, uh, which is maybe the most interesting part. We're going to use localization. So as many of you know, localization is basically a paradigm for reducing various geometric and analytic inequalities to dimension one while preserving the curvature lower bound. Now I know many of you are familiar with localization using the bisection method, okay, in, in Euclidean space. However, the modern interpretation of localization is as follows. If you start with a test function F, which is balanced, it integrates to zero, Okay, uh, with respect to your measure M. And this is exactly what happens in our functional inequalities. We have some balancing condition for our test function. Then using your test function F, you can produce a disintegration of your measure M into simpler measures M sub Q, so that three things hold. Your measures M, your simpler measures M Q are one dimensional. They're supported on distance minimizing geodesics. These are the needles that I guess many people are familiar with. In addition, your function F is still balanced with respect to these measures. That's very important. And thirdly, this, these measures MQ will all satisfy the same interpolation or curvature type inequality, such as the original measure, okay? So basically this technique uh, was, I think, uh, basically started with the work of Payne and Weinberger and rediscovered by Gromov and Vitaly Milman and certainly further developed and publicized by Kahn and Lovas and Shimonovich. But this is a, the bisection method. It was really restricted to our N. Maybe you could also do it on the sphere, but that's it. A breakthrough in the study of localization came in the groundbreaking work of Boaz Klartag, who extended this result to the smooth Riemannian setting for manifolds having Ricci curvature lower bound by K and dimension bounded above by N. And the idea of Boaz was to use L1, not L2 optimal transport. Unfortunately, I don't have time to give you more details, but basically, and then in the optimal transport community, they did this for metric measure spaces for satisfying MCP condition and satisfying the CD condition. This is the work by Cavaletti and Mondino, which was very influential. But it doesn't help us because we need QCD. We need localization for QCD. So our contribution here is to note that, well, under some technical assumptions, basically the localization paradigm is completely general, has nothing to do with the coefficients tau, has nothing to do with the Riemannian structure, nothing. Basically, as soon as you have any interpolation coefficients, tau naught and tau one, well, let's say they're continuous in each variable. And if the original measure satisfies this type of curvature uh, via this interpolation inequality, then when you do localization, all of these one dimensional measures will also satisfy the exact same uh, interpolation inequality. So for instance, this recovers all previous results because uh, if you use tau one being zero, you just kill this term, then you get the localization result for MCP. If you use uh, you know, the remaining coefficients here and here, you get the localization result for CDKN. And for us, for the QCD condition, well, we use the model coefficients tau kn divided by our slight parameter q. We localize to dimension one. And from here on, this is just a one dimensional uh, you know, problem. And we have our one dimensional lemma saying that we can pay a factor of q and modify our QCD density to get a CD density. Uh, and then this is why in all of our results, we pay a factor of q, right? Because if you modify your density by a factor of q, you have stability for all of our functional inequalities. You just have to pay an additional factor of Q. And this is why we get the one quarter. Uh, if you want kind of the details of this little argument, uh, you know, the whole, the whole kind of outline is here, but I'm out of time. And so I'll stop here.